Hello marine biology students! In this video, we're going to start talking about the diversity of life, specifically viruses and prokaryotes. So let's talk about the non-animal life in the ocean. We're going to start by discussing microscopic organisms, or microorganisms. When we had looked at the tree of life previously, you may have wondered where viruses were. Well, it turns out that viruses are not on the tree of life because viruses are not alive. They do not meet all of the characteristics of life. And viruses could not pre-exist life the same way that a computer software could not pre-exist computer hardware. Without the machinery, it wouldn't be able to do anything, including propagate. Viruses are a product of cells, but they are also found for every type of cell around. They are a consequence and a result of cells, and they will copy themselves as long as there are cells around. When we ask about viruses in the ocean, we would define a virus as a non-cellular, infectious agent. Viruses are not capable of reproduction without a host. When we look at the core structure of a virus, it is made up of a nucleic acid core, and some sort of capsid or covering, a protein coat. This protein coat could be made up of numerous protein subunits and arranged in a variety of different shapes. Among the viruses that are in the marine environment, there are some notable types, such as retroviruses. Which store their genetic information in the form of the nucleic acid RNA as opposed to DNA. Retroviruses have been known for a while, but they do defy what's known as the central dogma of genetics in that information is supposed to flow from DNA to RNA to protein. Well, retroviruses take their RNA information and they actually make molecules of DNA from it in the cells they're infecting. Another type of virus are lysogenic viruses. These lysogenic viruses actually insert their own DNA into the genomic DNA of their host. And sometimes this insertion can result in the virus being dormant or inactive for a while, and then at some point in the future coming out and start making more of itself. Another category of viruses are the bacteriophages. which specifically infect prokaryotic cells and multiply within them. After using some new methods of analysis, we have found that viruses are actually quite common in the marine environment, both in the water and also within sediments, on surfaces, and pretty much everywhere. These viruses can infect marine bacteria. plankton, seaweeds, plants, and animals. It turns out few of these marine viruses are pathogenic to humans. Because humans aren't the most common organisms in the marine environment. The exception would be if raw human waste or, or sewage is going into that water, then human pathogens could be present. But otherwise, the viruses that are present are going to be those viruses that can be copied by the cells in the environment. One action of viruses 
is lysis, or bursting of infected cells, which results in the release of those viruses into the water. This method of destroying or rupturing cells also results in the production of large amounts of dissolved organic matter, or DOM, into the marine environment. And DOM can be a major food source for many marine bacteria. Here we see a picture of one of the more bizarre marine viruses. This is known as a megavirus, and it's surprisingly big. In fact, it's bigger than many bacterial cells. These megaviruses have been found to infect oceanic amoeba. Most viruses are far smaller than this and wouldn't be able to be seen with a traditional microscope, but megaviruses are the exception. Now, when we look at these major groups of life, these domains, we have domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. Viruses can infect all of these types of cells, but again, viruses are not on this tree of life. We're going to spend some time talking about the prokaryotic domains, domain bacteria and domain archaea. What are some characteristics of archaea? and bacteria. First off, these cells are prokaryotic in that they do not have a nucleus. They have genetic material, they have cytoplasm and a plasma membrane and ribosomes, but they do not have internal organelle compartments, especially not ones that stores their genomic DNA. They have a single chromosome which is normally circular. They'll likely have cell walls in addition to their plasma membrane, and they have great metabolic diversity. They can get their energy from their environment in a variety of different ways. This is normally limited in more complex organisms. So the first of these groups we'll talk about are the archaea. These are ancient organisms. In fact, there are fossils of archaea that date back 3.8 billion years. They're one of the first forms of life on this planet. Archaea themselves have a variety of metabolic types. With some getting energy from methane, some getting energy from hydrothermal vents, others doing chemosynthesis, a variety of different ways to get their energy. Now it turns out that archaea are pretty widely distributed at sea, although they can end up living in environments that other forms of life are not able to. They can tolerate wide ranges in temperature, salinity, and even desiccation or drying out. They can be found in many areas, including near hydrothermal vents and salt flats, two very extreme environments. And here we can see a micrographic image of some of these archaea. These are methanogenic bacteria that live near deep sea hydrothermal vents. Next, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about marine bacteria. They come in a variety of shapes, including spirals, spheres, rods, and even ring-shaped bacteria. Their cell wall structure is semi-rigid but permeable. When it comes to size, they are normally microscopic. But there are some examples of large cells in marine bacteria, often in oxygen-poor environments. As with the archaea, we see a wide variety of metabolic types. Bacteria are very abundant worldwide. Here in these images, we can see one of those ring-shaped bacteria that are found in the marine environment. And then in the other slide, we can also see one of these extremely large bacterial cells. The little yellow granules within those cells are sulfur. 
when we talk about the ecological role that prokaryotes play in the marine environment, they often spend a lot of time breaking down dead organic matter. This forms detritus, minute particles of organic matter that are available as nutrition for other organisms. As we're going to see in many marine environments, suspension feeders and deposit feeders are filtering detritus out of the seawater as a food source. There are some bacteria which are photosynthetic, including cyanobacteria. And these can play a very important role in marine environments. They are one of the primary producers. Certain cyanobacteria can also end up secreting calcium carbonate, and these form structures known as stromatolites. Stromatolites make up some of the oldest fossils we have of life here on planet Earth. And they're still around today. They are still being formed in certain marine environments. Here we see a scuba diver scuba diving next to some of these stromatolites, structures that are quite large, but are made by cyanobacteria. As had been mentioned several times, there is great metabolic diversity in the archaea and bacteria. Some bacteria are photosynthetic. meaning they derive their energy from sunlight. Some bacteria are chemosynthetic. And they get their energy from inorganic chemical compounds like hydrogen sulfide. And some are heterotrophic. meaning that they break down organic molecules for energy. Prokaryotes with all three of these energy gathering methods are important in marine environments. So that takes us to the end of our discussion of viruses and prokaryotes. Now before our next video, I want you to think, what does it take for something to be a plant or an animal? We'll talk about that in our next video.